to Ty Detmer, who, as I said earlier, yes, you need to be here. You're, you're an integral part of Media Day, Ty, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Uh, what's the feeling like for you this day now compared to how it was last year? Uh, you know, last year was, I mean, I, I'd waking up every morning at 4 a.m. like, uh, what are we going to do? Um, so this year has been a little more calm, been able to enjoy uh, being here and, and uh, spring ball and getting to know the players a little more, not feeling so, you know, scatterbrained that you got to get everything in and how are we going to do this, how are we going to do that. You kind of we know the drill now, we've been through it, and uh, can kind of dig in and enjoy it a little more. When did you get to the point where you didn't feel like you needed to wake up at 4 a.m. anymore? Um, or do you still? I still actually time to time do. You know, you start looking at the schedule and, and the clock's ticking in our offices <laughs> with 61 days to game day or whatever it is now. It, that thing will not quit. It, it will not quit ticking. No, it's, you know, it's coming. So you never, you know, feel totally relaxed um, with the season coming you know there's always something in the back of your mind that you feel like you got to get done or we got to talk about and and uh you know but it's a little less now than it was last year what did you learn about yourself as a play caller after one year in college uh as you said that the run game was good so you know i don't think uh when you got Jamal, like you said, how hard is it to call plays? Just don't be <laughs> dumb. Give him the ball, right? Um, but, no, I think um, the hope was you wouldn't go in in the first game. We'd have six delay of game penalties and burn all our timeouts in the first series, that the plays would be able to get in in a timely manner. And, and also that you realize you got help. You know, we got coaches on the headsets, and, and our staff is great. We communicate well. Um, you know, they're sharp guys that – give you some feedback between series that okay you know you can get to these plays too so you're not in it just by yourself you've got help um, I'm able to you know get it in timely manner and we're able to to run the show and and uh, that was the concern last year was like man okay all this pressure well it's it's still 40 second play clock just like it was in high school um, you got probably a little more help at this level with the other the other coaches that are there working with you and uh, and so, you know, as the season went on, a little more calm and, and no one pregame jitters weren't quite as bad as the season went on. We hear a lot about the game slowing down for players on the field and, you know, things starting to kind of materialize. Does that same concept apply as an offensive coordinator? It does, definitely. Um, you know, and like I said, we've got great staff, coaches that we communicate. And, and so as the game goes on, I, you know, last year we were a little better second-half team um, because of adjustments we were able to make and communication with coaches and players and and uh, kind of figure out what we're seeing because, you know, we're, we're not a spread team. And so some, there are some games where we – all we have is spread – teams to watch and so how are they going to play us with a tight end maybe two tight ends or a fullback you know they play you differently and so sometimes you go into a game not sure you kind of have an idea but you're not sure what you're going to see so those first couple series are feel it out a little bit what are we getting how are they playing us and then you can start tweaking and and uh, making adjustments and the players kind of get it and and uh, the coaches coach them up, and then at halftime you make some adjustments, and we were able to kind of get going. Seems like when you have a new coaching staff and you implement these, you know, new s schemes, you're trying to match up a little bit. Like, what's the strength of the personnel versus what we want to establish long term with the scheme? So, what kind of progress has been made in matching the personnel to scheme, or vice versa? Yeah, well, I think you know, recruiting goes into that. Uh, you know, we moved Moroni to tight end, so we brought him down, put his hand on the ground. Matt Bushman came off a mission was like, oh, this guy, oversized receiver in high school, he would be a great tight end candidate. You know, it's the same thing. So he and Moroni are 6'5", 230, and kind of where they need to be. Um, and so that helps kind of tweak things and, and get to where you want to be using the tight end a little more in the passing game. Uh, Tanner and Hunter did great, and and uh, but they don't quite have the down the field stretch that Moroni and, and Matt Bushman do. So um, it it is matching your personnel, figuring out what you have, and then let's try to put them in a position that that they can be the most successful. And and now a different group of guys this year a little bit with 
with that position. So how do we move them around? How do we get our backs involved or Trey dies, maybe a better receiver out of the backfield, KJ Hall, move him around a little bit, um, you know, mix and match those guys. So it'll be a different different feel, different um, look a little bit um, as opposed to last year where we get Jamal back there and, and give him or Taysom a, a two-way go and, and uh, allow them to kind of handle the run game, that type of deal. So every year is a little different, and it'll be that way just based on guys coming and going. And, uh, you know, we've got some good young receivers that are chomping at the bit to, to get their name out there with the, some of the greats that have played here. Jonah Trinneman just told us if he could have his way, he would triple last year's touchdown pass total from 15 to 45. So, How does that sound, Ty? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Let's do it. There's a lot of questions about – yeah, it's that simple. All right, right? great. Okay, we'll do it. Us. All right, yeah, great. awesome. Uh, a lot of questions about the running back position because you are trying to replace a guy like Jamal Williams, which you can't really do. Um, he doesn't come around very often. But you have some capable players, Squally Canada – Ula Tolutau, we just found out, has uh, put his weight down to 250. He's getting stronger and faster. Riley Burt, uh, you mentioned K.J. Hall. What what kind of a running back scheme are we going to see this year? Yeah, I mean, you may see two tailbacks in there together. You may be Braden Elbacher, he's our fullback. So, you know, you add him to the mix. Great receiver out of the backfield as well. Um Maybe more two tights and and single back. It, it, you know, every every week would be a little different. Um, but that running back group, they all bring something different to the table. And so it's up to us as coaches to get them in the right situation, the right type of play call for them, and then utilize their strengths to their you know to their advantage. Give people an idea of what BYU has at receiver right now. You you just mentioned some guys are you know itching to get their names out there. BYU loses the top three receivers from last year, yet there's some good young talent in that group. There is, and that that's probably the biggest question you get from people around town is, well, who are the receivers going to be? And, and uh, you know, Talon Shumway got a little playing time last year, but having four senior receivers, those guys didn't really – the guys behind them didn't get much of an opportunity to really get in rotation. Um, but, you know, you, you got Jonah back, who's now got experience, been in the system. We kind of know him a little better. Got to find ways to get him the ball more. Uh, Aleva Hifo got playing time as a freshman and is very dynamic. Now, knowing the offense, unfortunately, missed spring ball, so he didn't get some reps there. Uh, Micah Simon had a really good spring, brings, you know, a little more of a speed factor to the game. Akili Davis, same type of deal. Um, so, you know, Bo Tanner's there. That's one of the faster guys as well. That was year one. Um, you know, there's guys there and, uh, as a coaching staff, we feel very good about those guys. And it, you know, just because maybe you haven't heard their name and as much as, as, you know, Kurtz and Jurgens and, you know, Pearson and those guys doesn't mean they can't play. Yeah. Continuity is comfortable. Right. And, and. These, some of these guys are new, but this is going to be their opportunity this year. Now, you were very clear and outspoken about Tanner Mangum's progression after spring ball, saying, look, he knows the offense better. He spent a lot of time in film and the playbook, and he just feels more comfortable in it. This question now in furthering that thought from at Twig Year Stone, what do we need to see from Tanner Mangum in camp to know that he is ready for this challenging schedule? Well, hopefully you don't see a lot because we're not putting a lot out there for <laughs> Portland State and LSU and Utah and everybody else. But, no, um, I just think seeing him get through progressions quickly, getting the ball out of his hand quickly, if he's sitting there holding it a long time, we got problems. You know, that's, that's not a good sign. That's either we're not open or we're not sure what we're looking at. So um, if if he's going through his reads and the ball's coming out quickly, he's he's got it. And uh, – and he did that in the spring. He completed a very high percentage of throws, the ball. He wasn't holding it and having to move around and buy time, although that's one of his strengths um, that he can do that. Uh, so, you know, the hope is that he's comfortable and, and he's getting it going through his progression really quickly and, and understanding it, getting the check downs quickly. If he's getting to the backs, you know, fairly quick, that means he's gone through his progression and he's checked it down and the ball's out of his hand and we're not holding it. When you look at the 2017 schedule, 13 games, some really good ones on there, what's the 
the word that comes to your mind? What's the emotion that you have when you look at that schedule? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really go and just look at a full year schedule. You know, you, you kind of break it down a little bit into quarters, you know, at times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for me, it's Portland State. I mean, that every year you see it where, you know, an FCS team or, or something jumps up and, and gets a power five team. And so you got to fight that challenge. I think having youth uh, at our skilled positions will help us. They've kind of got some unknowns themselves. So hopefully they're not overlooking Portland state looking ahead to the rest of the schedule because Portland state plays good ball. And uh, you know, it's coach speak cliches, you know, one game at a time. But for us, we, we took a couple of days of spring ball and just, focused on Portland State and went against what what they're going to do. We didn't go against LSU or Utah or Wisconsin. We we went against our first game because that's the most important for us. And uh, But overall, I mean, it is it is a fun, challenging schedule with different games on the road, different parts of the country, and, and uh, that's kind of what makes Independence neat is uh, we, we get to go all over and, and play great teams. That's nice, Ty. So you're telling me in 1990 <laughs> – that before you played at UTEP, before Miami, people forget there was another game. So you didn't think about Miami at all. You were only thinking well, about you're, UTEP. Well, you're thinking about it. I mean, we've watched LSU. We've watched <laughs> Utah. We've watched some of those as a coaching staff. Yeah, you don't yeah. want the players doing that. Yes. But, uh, but So but when you were a player them. in 90, you play at UTEP. You're like, oh, we got this in the bag the year before. We probably killed them. <laughs> we did. but <laughs> So – there's there's no other – I mean, college football is crazy because even in high school you have a couple scrimmages to get ready and get guys, see them in game speed. You get one game. College, you, you just – no games. No guess. games. You, yeah. you practice, and it's hard to simulate game speed so things get on guys quickly. And, uh, and so that UTEP game for us, it was still – yeah, Miami's sitting there, but that first game is – I mean, you're going into it blind a little bit. And so – uh, you got to play, and, and a lot of times those those first games are a lot closer than maybe they would week two or three. The good news is, well, or the bad news, the overreaction to whatever happens against Portland State will be enormous. Oh yeah! If you win seventy to nothing, it'll be oh BYU is ready for LSU. We are on it. We've got it covered. <laughs> LSU's in big trouble. If it's thirty-five to fourteen, it'll be like oh BYU gave up only one by twenty-one. You know. It's going to be fun no matter what. Well, that, I mean, that's, that's every week, though. Here. That's part of being a fan, right? That's, that's the, BYU, it's the BYU, BYU fan yeah. culture. Ty, it's great to have you with us. Uh, by the way, at Jeff Aka tweets in, ask Ty to do impersonations of you guys. I don't know if you want to do that on the spot. You Ooh, can, man. or you can work on that. I might have that. to work a little bit on that. and then but... bring it later. Uh, Jerem Jordan here. <laughs> <laughs> We're both kind of nasally. I mean, I mean, I can't really make fun of somebody that talks nasally. It's not off. Like, no, I got it. I, can I bring that, a mustache next time and I'll prepare really, a little really bit? That was really, really solid. The old mustache, Jerem Jordan. Oh wow, you're going way back. <laughs> Even I've forgotten about that. You should just shave your head too and do the whole deal. Uh, that wouldn't look. I got too skinny a head. We already so. have to stare at a lights too. Yeah, that was that was priceless, Ty. That was so good. I noticed uh, he didn't try and do you. <laughs> Yeah. He doesn't need to do me. He already he. You just won. You just won the, the, the award. Que- man. The question was of you guys. No, plural. No, I see it. He didn't try right to do me either, though. That's, well, no, it's just you for us. I know, but he didn't. He I, hasn't tried to do me, has he? No. Well, he does Bill Walton and Adam Sandler and Louis. Oh Holtz. boy. Yeah, I remember Ty Detmer throwing seventy-five touchdown passes <laughs> in three games. It was unbelievable. And when I came off the bench, I was the best six man that ever played the game. <laughs> He gets it. He gets it. Ty, great to have you with us. Uh, Obviously, this is a very fun day. We're excited about what's to come. And 64 days. That clock's still running, man. I know. It's ticking. 63 and change now. When you wake up at 4 a.m., just think about plugging your nose. (laughs) (laughs) Personage. That hopefully is not the first thing I think of at 4 (laughs) a.m. Please don't think of me first. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Oh, so good.